Hi everyone and welcome to Psychopathology and Diagnosis. In this video, we're going to review your course, go over the history of diagnosis, and talk about what we're going to dive into into this course together. So welcome to Module 1 and I hope that you find this class as enjoyable as I do. When working with clients, it's important to have a framework to help us understand and conceptualize the client's needs and having a good understanding of the diagnosis can help us wrap collaborative treatment planning around our clients. This course will give you the background on the etiology or the why the symptomology or the what, and the treatment or the how, and prepare you for work in the field and in your practicum and internship. There's so much to cover in these next few weeks. This is really just going to be the beginning of your personal dive into diagnosis, and there's no way that you're going to be able to memorize all the diagnostic criteria, and that's not the point of this course. The idea here is that you familiarize yourself with the DSM, with the process of diagnosis, and can use the text as a reference for your future work. As part of the course introduction, I want to look at some definitions and what we'll be covering in the course. We'll talk about psychopathology, which is the science and the study of mental disorders. The etiology is the cause or the why. The symptomology, the what or the onset of symptoms that you might be noticing. How to diagnose, treatment. We'll also talk a little bit about medication throughout the course. And I encourage you to get curious and ask questions. There's so much information out there. This one course can't possibly cover everything, but hopefully will give you a jumping off point to be considering diagnostics when working with clients. And for this course, I ask you to please interact with the content multiple times weekly. There's a lot to do in each module and your best learning will happen not by cramming, but by sitting with the material and really thinking about the application. Think about what you've learned so far about empathy and seeing the individual. Diagnosis is more than just checking boxes of present symptoms, but seeing all the things that make up people you're treating. So you can make a diagnosis based on holistic and evidence-based practices. The DSM is a massive book we're going to be using throughout the semester. It weighs just under five pounds, just in case anybody wants to do some bicep curls with it. Each module has about two chapters of the DSM in it, and I'll offer a recorded lecture about each and ask that you have already read through the associated chapters so that the lecture and the in-class experiences are additional learning, not catch up. Whether you have the DSM-5 or the DSM-5TR, it doesn't matter to me. I'll be talking mostly about the 5TR, but feel free to use whichever text you can get your hands on. The DSM is empirical or based on research. It's the standard text used across treatment settings in the United States so that clinicians are all speaking the same language. Psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, social workers, family therapists, medical doctors, plus more all use the DSM. And there are additional texts that you'll hear about, like the ICD-10. That's like a kissing cousin of the DSM, but for our purposes, you'll focus on the DSM in this course. So the history of mental health diagnosis traces back to ancient civilizations with Hippocrates, introducing the concept of humoral imbalance in the 5th century BCE. During the Middle Ages, mental illnesses were often attributed to supernatural causes, while the Renaissance saw a resurgence of scientific inquiry. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Pinnell advocated for humane treatment and observable symptom-based classifications. There was some work done in the early 20th century that laid the groundwork for modern diagnostic systems, and the DSM first published in 1952 and periodically updated standardized mental health diagnosis. Today, the DSM-5 continues to guide clinicians reflecting ongoing research and societal changes. So a quick rundown of the DSM, since that's the text that we'll be using as our main focus, you know, it's important to know where we've come from so that we know where we are and where we're going. So starting with the DSM-1 published in 1952, the first edition of the DSM by the American Psychiatric Association, it represented the APA's first attempt to provide standardized classification system for mental disorders. DSM-1 included 106 diagnostic categories and 132 pages was pretty small and was heavily influenced by psychoanalytic theory. It focused on inpatient psychiatry as outpatient treatment wasn't widely being used yet. Asylums and institutions were still the common treatment options aside from a lobotomy. In 1968, the DSM-2 was published, and it expanded the number of diagnostic categories to 182, but retained a largely psychoanalytic perspective. DSM-2 continued to categorize homosexuality as a mental disorder, a classification that would later be revised. The DSM-1 and 2 were used for statistical purposes, like the title suggests, but were not guides to clinical practice. 
A third edition of the DSM published in 1980 marked a significant departure from previous editions. It introduced a multi-axle system for diagnosis. In this system, group disorders, so axis one disorders were considered more treatable and axis two were considered to be more pervasive like personality disorders. This multi-axle system was abandoned in the DSM-5, but the DSM-3 also moved away from psychoanalytic theory more towards an empirically based approach. DSM-3 included explicit diagnostic criteria and was aimed for greater reliability and validity in diagnosis. And it was written as, does this person might meet criteria for A through F, or do they meet A through D, or do they meet three of the seven? Do they have all these things present or enough of them to be diagnosed? So what you'll be reading about in the DSM-5 looks pretty similar to the three, just as far as diagnosis goes. The DSM-3 was revised in 1987, resulting in the publication of the DSM-3R, and this revision made minor changes and clarifications to diagnostic criteria, but largely retained the structure and diagnostic categories of the DSM-3. And the fourth edition of the DSM was published in 1994. DSM-4 further refined diagnostic criteria and introduced new disorders while eliminating others. In this one, they said, hey, we really want to increase research. We're going to have more people come together and create this book and involve more than a thousand individuals and numerous professional organizations. The more they researched and communicated together, the more in-depth the approval system became to add and subtract and change the content. You can't just add a diagnosis because because it seemed like a good idea, there had to be research to back it up. This was the first time that we put in that not otherwise specified or NOS category, meaning we don't really know what's going on here, but we can't make the diagnosis finite yet. And the DSM-4 text revision was published in 2000, which included minor updates to text revisions to the DSM-4. It aimed to improve clarity and consistency in diagnostic criteria. The DSM-4-TR, or text revision, was published to correct the factual errors that were identified in the text to ensure that all information was still accurate and up-to-date to reflect some of the new information available. And I'm so old, this is the one that I learned on originally. The fifth edition of the DSM was published in 2013, and throughout the 13-year time span that they were working on it, there were ongoing revisions occurring due to how long it was taking to publish. And for the first time, the APA published those working revisions online and invited comments from the public. Most of the DSM-4 was still applicable, but they had to keep revising because, as we know, things don't stay the same in humans and we're developing all the time this new technology, creating new theories. We have new science coming out, and we found out things about the brain in the early 90s and 2000s, and today brain imaging has increased even more. So we know much more about disorders like anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder than we knew before. So to stay current, there were always review boards looking at what needed to be added. So we clearly stated what a definition of a mental disorder was moving from the DSM-4 to DSM-5. We'll talk about that in a bit. But as a special note for writing the DSM, if you're citing papers, DSM-1, 2, 3, and 4 are all written in Roman numerals, and the DSM-5 is written with the number 5. So that's not a misprint. That was an intentional change. And then the DSM-5-TR, the newest edition published in 2022, includes a comprehensive review of the impact of racism and discrimination in the diagnosis and manifestations of mental disorders. So if you can get your hands on the 5-TR, that one's going to be really beneficial to aid with cultural considerations. Each edition of the DSM reflects advancements in the understanding of mental disorders, changes in the diagnostic practices, and shifts in psychiatric theory. The DSM continues to evolve over time to reflect ongoing developments in the field of mental health. The DSM-5 breaks things into subtypes and specifiers. Subtypes are defined as mutually exclusive and jointly exhausted phenomenological subgrouping, meaning that within certain diagnoses, whether it's bipolar disorder, whether it's autism spectrum, spectrum disorder, or it's ADHD or depression, there will be subtypes underneath each. An example of this could be how specific phobias are divided into several subtypes, such as phobia of animals, phobia of situations like fear of flying, fear of heights. And there will also be specifiers, which are an extension to a diagnosis to clarify a disorder or illness further, and they allow for more specific diagnoses. So examples for this might include specifiers for depression. 
There's chronic, catatonic, postpartum onset, also known as postpartum depression, or seasonal pattern, also known as seasonal affective disorder. So you'll see that sometimes these things that we think are their own diagnoses are actually just nestled underneath a larger umbrella diagnosis. So traditionally, medicine has defined disease in a way that separates pathology from normality. We all suffer illness from time to time, but otherwise consider ourselves normal. Psychiatry took the same view for most of its history, and it remains reasonable to separate disease like disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and melancholic depression from reaction patterns like mild depressive or anxiety disorders. And an old joke states that life is a disease for which psychiatry is the cure. And behind that joke lies a reality. It's not obvious what distinguishes mental disorder from unhappiness. Psychiatry distinguishes between sadness and depression, between moodiness and bipolarity, between eccentricity and psychosis. That is what has traditionally defined the very concept of psychopathology. In the DSM-5, they define a mental disorder as clinically significant behavioral or psychological syndrome pattern associated with distress or disability, and it must significantly increase the risk, suffering, death, pain, disability, or import loss of freedom. So it has to be an impairment. If the person does not have an impairment, then there isn't a disorder. Symptoms must not appear as part of normal development or reflect cultural variations alone. They must not be developmental quirks, such as the moodiness of a normal adolescent, or cultural patterns, such as possession states cultivated by some religions. When looking at this from an individual view, a client's perspective, we're meant to be classifying a disorder, not classifying a person. We don't say that person's borderline or that person's bipolar or I don't want to work with schizophrenics. We don't say that as professional counselors. We say that people struggle with or are diagnosed with a disorder and that we're also taking into account cultural context. What might be a disease for one culture, it might not for another, or some disorders might be called things differently in different parts of the world. The DSM emphasizes that cultural, societal, and personal expectations may influence the evaluation and classification of mental disorders DSM criteria alone cannot fully describe the unique nature of individuals in the particular circumstances that have led to the development of their disorders. If all we're doing is simply collecting diagnostic information and offering a diagnosis, we're missing the phenomenon of who this person actually is, where they're coming from, where they're going. A diagnosis nor a psychosocial interview is going to get close to telling the whole story of one client, which is why we may not offer a diagnosis upon the first meeting of someone. There's plenty of issues with the use of the DSM. These books aren't perfect. And despite the copious amounts of research, you could probably still look at diagnosing as more of an art than a science. Things are always changing. We're always learning more. Right now, the diagnoses are grouped in ways that link core themes together, but with time, those links and groupings may change as our understanding of the disorders change. A lot of the categories will feel like they bleed over into each other, and it can get a little messy to figure out what you're working with. When we get to OCD, ADHD, PTSD, you'll notice that a lot of it can look like the other. Even borderline personality disorder and PTSD can present in the same way. Mental health conditions often change over time, and individuals may experience fluctuations in symptoms or develop comorbidities. Diagnostic labels may not adequately reflect these dynamic processes. And talking a bit about pop culture now on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, you'll see people on there self-diagnosing or talking about symptoms that aren't identified by the DSM. This be can become very misleading where now everyone thinks they have an anxiety disorder or PTSD or autism. We need to remember counselors and diagnosticians in this, this spectrum of normal and abnormal psychology. Just because we feel the emotions of anxiety does not mean we have an anxiety disorder. Just because we're socially awkward does not mean we have autism. Just because we've been through a trauma experience does not mean that we have PTSD and so on. The DSM uses some language you'll hear me saying over and over to help with this. It's clinically significant distress. This clinically significant distress is what separates the normal expected reactions to situations from abnormal psychology that meets criteria for a diagnosis. Another limitation of the DSM and the diagnostic process is the potential for diagnostic labels to stigmatize individuals and overshadow their unique experiences and circumstances. When we focus solely on diagnosis, it may detract from understanding the individual as a whole. 
So we want to assess for symptoms. It's also equally important to assess for strengths and assets. There is not a statistical manual or diagnosis for strengths, which just solidifies that our focus is often more on what's going wrong than what's going well. And I would argue that while the DSM is a good stepping stone in direction, we need more nuanced and comprehensive approaches to understanding mental health beyond diagnostic categories, taking into account factors such as individual differences, context, psychosocial factors. Diagnosis should be supplemented with broader assessments and personalized treatment approaches. We must be trained to use good clinical judgment in our approaches with clients. Diagnosing mental health conditions often requires clinicians to rely on their clinical judgment rather than solely on objective measures. This reliance on subjective assessment can lead to variability and bias in diagnostic decisions. Regardless of which diagnostic manual is used, whether it's the DSM-4, DSM-5, or any subsequent editions, clinical judgment is required. That's why you're here, to cultivate these judgment skills. Diagnosis isn't about matching symptoms to criteria. It's about understanding the nuances of each case, considering the individual differences, and recognizing that not every patient or client fits neatly into the boxes of diagnostic categories. You'll find that the DSM often fences certain diagnoses into arbitrary cutoff points, like six months, one year, two of 10 symptoms present. And while these cutoff points are generally the consensus of researchers and experts, we must also look at those that fall outside of these fences or cutoff points that still seem to meet criteria for all intents and purposes of the diagnosis without fitting the APA's definition of a disorder. Medicine will use blood tests and other objective testing to diagnose. Disorders of the mind are also disorders of the brain, but the brain is not as easy to understand as the heart or the kidneys. It may be most complex structure in the entire universe, thus mental disorders cannot easily be reduced to the biology of neurons. Mental health is different and subjective, and we can't be sure that any category of the manual is valid. So the lesson here is to stay humble. There are many wrong answers, just as many that could be considered right. Effective diagnosis requires training, experience, and the ability to apply criteria flexibly. Counselors must understand that diagnostic criteria represent a consensus at a fairly particular point in time, and revisions and updates are ongoing. New disorders may be identified, others may be removed in future editions in diagnostic manuals. For example, homosexuality was listed as a mental disorder in the DSM until 1973. We obviously know now that that's not a disorder, but the thinking at the time was very different. The removal of homosexuality from the DSM marked a milestone in the recognition of the LGBTQ plus rights and acknowledgement of sexual orientation as a natural variation of human behavior rather than a pathology. Questions to ponder. What do you think is in there now that doesn't belong? What do you think isn't in there that does? Is there a diagnosis that you don't agree with so much that you would never diagnose it? What is it and why? This continual evolution of the way that we understand human behavior necessitates the need for counselors to exercise clinical judgment, remain flexible in their approach, and stay educated on advancements in the field and maintain competence in their practice. Ultimately, what matters most in diagnosis is not just the application of criteria, but also the empathy, understanding, and genuine care that you will bring to your interactions with clients. With clinical judgment also comes taking into account the systemic and cultural considerations that we talked about earlier. It's crucial and it's key to what we do. You'll start to notice a pattern in the language of the DSM. You'll want to rule out medical causes of symptoms or behaviors before you diagnose a mental disorder. One of my favorite examples is dehydration, fatigue, changes in mood, irritability, mood swings, cognitive impairment, sleep disturbances, appetite changes. So if I'm looking for a mental health disorder that matches those symptoms, I'll end up diagnosing that person with depression, right? All the same symptoms but there's actually a medical reason for it. So get this guy some water, maybe an IV, do some blood work, see if there's an underlying clause, and wham, bam, they're feeling better. Prozac's not going to be the answer here, nor would cognitive behavioral therapy. Water's the answer. So what the DSM is missing is the same language about ruling out cultural considerations before making a diagnosis. Never look for a psychological explanation unless every effort to find a cultural one has been exhausted. 
cultural considerations, and certain religious practices or beliefs may be misdiagnosed as a psychotic disorder. Consider this example of somebody going into a prayer state and hallucinating after fasting. What does food deprivation look like? What does sensory deprivation look like? What does homelessness look like? What about different cultures grieving? Cultural norms and values shape how individuals express psychological distress. Some cultures may express distress through physical symptoms, somatization, or through idioms of distress that may not align well with Western diagnostic criteria. Some cultures have specific syndromes or patterns of symptoms that are unique to their cultural context. For example, certain Asian cultures recognize syndromes like Huya Bayang or Shizing Shueri, which may not have direct equivalent in Western diagnostic symptoms. So that initial evaluation for diagnosis is only the first step in comprehensive evaluation. We need to look at what else should we be seeing? What else is there? Who is this person that we're sitting across from? Counselors need to demonstrate cultural competence by recognizing their own biases, understanding cultural differences, and adapting their approach to diagnosis and treatment in culturally sensitive and respectful because we treat the individual, not the diagnosis. And I want you to keep that in mind as we're moving throughout the semester. That's why I'm saying it so much today. We treat the individual, not the diagnosis. And as we start to go through neurocognitive and neurodevelopmental disorders, I want you to see the people behind the case studies, the videos, and start to connect the human lived experience with the criteria that we're talking about in the DSM. There will always be a cultural component to consider. So I invite you to take some time to explore the text, really open up that book and see how it's organized. We'll be jumping around between disorders each week and you'll find many of them will start with overlapping neurological or treatment aspects. And so we'll take a look at some of the things that commonly co-occur together. So take some time, ask some questions, do some research and some questions to keep in mind as you explore each disorder. What are the causes? What's the pathway? What does this look like phenomenologically? And what am I missing? How are we going to help somebody heal? As always, you can contact me via email, reach out to me to schedule virtual office hours. I'm looking forward to meeting each of you. Thanks.